back by truth by profession, writing and teaching philosophy, yeah. back behind me. Uh, and I'm here to say some things that I think none of the other speakers have touched upon or might be willing to say. I'm not here to preach the choir. I want to first turn to socialism. And I think it's important to recognize that today in the world there are only two nations that can truly be called socialist. Cuba and North Korea. For decades, these two nations have eliminated almost all independent free enterprise, and the state has taken total control, virtually, of the economy. In so doing, it has eliminated class divisions by a universal proletarization, where virtually everyone has become an employee of the state. In both cases, you have a one-party dictatorship where a party elite has total control of the state and the economy. And that has resulted in a state monopoly socialism involving the total disempowerment of the working class. And since virtually everyone in Cuba and North Korea are employees of the state, the disempowerment of the working class involves a of everyone except the party elite that lords over them. Now this policy has operated under the assumption that one needs to eliminate private enterprise and have complete state control of the economy in order to achieve social emancipation. But if you think hard about the different forms that capital can take, the way in which it can be subject to all sorts of public regulation, and think about, honestly, the experience of socialist nations. It's quite clear that there is no automatic necessary connection between state ownership of commerce and employment at fair wages, safe working conditions, any kind of employee empowerment, any kind of furnishing of adequate consumer goods, any respect for the environment. There are only two things that state appropriation of the economy involves. One is the obliteration of any room for independent entrepreneurial initiative, and the other is the establishment of the greatest monopoly an economy can have, where the masters of the state have total control over the economy. Now in such conditions, it takes tremendous courage to go out onto the streets and protest against the deprivation and oppression of one state monopoly socialist masters. The thousands of Cubans who recently came out in the streets had no economic independence to fall back upon. They had no independent trade unions or other social organizations who could come to their aid. They had no independent political institutions because no, the people of Cuba have not chosen their socialist masters. They have no independent media. And instead, they were shot they were beaten, they were arrested. Now, the oppression that has been suffered by the people of Cuba has indeed been accentuated by a decades-long embargo. And it's important to recognize that embargo cannot possibly have any positive impact upon a socialist nation. It cannot do anything for the good in Cuba. It cannot do anything for the good in North Korea. And there's a simple reason for that. Because these socialist regimes have completely eliminated all independent economic actors, there is no one in Cuba or North Korea who can wield any economic influence when they find an embargo harming them. The situation was completely different in South Africa, where because you had a mixed economy, there were significant private corporations and enterprises that were finding their economic fortunes deteriorating due to the embargo. And they could put pressure on the apartheid regime and ultimately lead to its handing over power to the ADC. But in a state socialist monopoly power, embargoes can have no such effect. And all they do is increase the hardship of the people while the party leadership continues to enjoy all its privileges. Now today in the world, 
every nation except Cuba and North Korea has a mixed economy. And that includes the communist dictatorships in China and Vietnam. And we are distinguished among the nations with a mixed economy in having the greatest imbalance of power between employer and employee among those nations that have any of democracy. We have the weakest labor movement. We have the lowest amount of unionization. We have the most oppressive labor legislation. And American employees have absolutely no role in the governance of U.S. corporations. On top of that, our Constitution completely ignores the fundamental social rights to jobs and fair wages, to decent housing, to health care, to education at all levels to legal care and representation in civil and criminal cases, and to be able to live in an environment that is genuinely livable. And it should therefore be no surprise that among developed nations, we have the greatest degree of wealth and income inequality. We have the largest amount of mass poverty. We have the least amount of social mobility. And we have the greatest amount of crime. And because in America, the failure to fulfill our social rights has meant that everything we need to prosper is something we have access to only according to how much wealth we have. The gap in income and wealth between black and white and men and women has continued to perpetuate itself and deepen despite all the real gains of civil rights movements and women liberation. Now today there are many who are now saying the solution, the remedy to these problems is to be found in a socialism, a different kind of socialism. Not the state monopoly socialism of the late socialisms of Cuba and North Korea, but a socialism that goes by the name of democratic socialism or social democracy. Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, the social democratic parties the world over. The small democratic VSA in the US are presenting a socialism as if it were the remedy, but I think it's important to recognize that the use of the term socialism here is completely misleading. Because Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, the DSA, all the social democratic parties the world over are capitalist voters. They are all committed to a mixed economy with private and public enterprise. And despite the fact that some people like Bernie Sanders will speak about a political revolution, and other democratic socialists will make all sorts of pseudo-revolutionary gestures, those who call for social democracy are reformists who intend to maintain parliamentary democracy and make use of it to have the proper kinds of reform. Now there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that because the task we face is not instituting socialism and wiping out independent enterprise, but rather reforming capitalism in the human face, where we fulfill all our social rights, ensure that enterprise does not undermine our family welfare, does not take away our equal political opportunity, does not prevent us from having equal opportunity and for employees to have a fair say in the management of corporations. But we have to recognize that the path to fulfill these measures is something that has important consequences for how we deal with the rest of the world. It's not simply a matter that we in our relations to Latin America should start arming dictators with the most advanced weaponry to use on their peoples. It's not that we should end trade agreements that allow subsidize U.S. corporations, agribusinesses to dump their products and destroy local peasant agriculture. It's not that we should only end the war on, on crime and make legal all use of drugs so as to put the cartels out of business and to have control of weapons so that they cannot arm themselves as heat. No, we have to do something much more than keeping hands off of Haiti, off of Cuba, off of the rest of Latin America. We have to engage in a massive proactive form of assistance. And this has become all the more crucial.
face of two crises that have not gone away. One being the pandemic, and the other is the advancing climate catastrophe that we are facing. Now I look around here and I see very few of you wearing masks. None of you are social distancing. We're all acting as if the pandemic were over. Well, the pandemic has transformed itself. It is now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Now in the United States, 50% of us have been vaccinated. 50% of us have not been vaccinated. And in backward regions like Georgia, two-thirds of the population has not been vaccinated. And they have been not vaccinated out of choice in most cases. Because if they have taken the morally bankrupt position of allowing themselves to become spreaders of a disease that will put themselves, their families, and their neighbors in mortal danger. Now in Latin America, in Africa, in much of Asia, the situation is entirely different. Because wealthy nations like the United States have bought up almost all the supplies of vaccines. The peoples of these nations do not have access to vaccines. Today, only 1% of the population in these countries, including all of Latin America, all of Africa, most of Asia, are completely unprotected. And their nations do not have access to the mass testing and economic support that would allow them to do what New Zealand and China and Taiwan and a few other nations could do in successfully curtailing the pandemic without having to rely on vaccines. But we face a situation where if we keep our hands off and do not act proactively to vaccinate every human being on the planet, we are going to see tens of millions of casualties, hundreds of millions of people becoming destitute because of the economic fallout. And we're going to see the development of mutations in the COVID virus that may become unstoppable. Now, in some respect, all of these measures which call for a massive mobilization by the United States to assist Haiti, to assist Cuba, to assist all countries, no matter what kind of regime they have, to fully vaccinate their population, we also have to deal with the advancing climate catastrophe. We see it affecting Germany with floods. We see it affecting our Northwest, heatwaves killing hundreds. We see it with fires waging. We see it with the California agricultural hotline drying up. But these effects pale in comparison to what's going on in Latin America, in Africa, in much of Asia, where far greater amount, numbers of humanity are going to face egregious hardships and lack the resources to do anything about it. Today, the countries in Latin America, as well as those in Africa and much of Asia, need to increase their energy production in order to increase the opportunity of their peoples. And many are embarking on a huge expansion in coal-fired power plants and fossil fuel power, power plants. And they don't have the resources to replace them with clean energy. Well, we have to step in, not having hands off on Haiti and the other nations of Latin America, but entering into alliances with those nations that have the resources to have a massive influx of clean energy resources. But it has to be not just a Green New Deal that is domestic, because remember, we produce only 15% of fossil fuel emissions. It has to be an international Green New Deal. And it has to involve the New Deal part of the Green New Deal. Namely, we have to ensure that the peoples of Latin America do not have any of their livelihoods put at risk by the transition to we have to ensure that everyone who is willing to work has a job and that they have access to health care and education and housing and so forth. This requires that we not spend trillions of dollars on wars like those in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that we instead spend trillions of dollars vaccinating the world, making a transition to clean energy. And today, as you know, we have a dwindling window of opportunity of a year and a half for the 2020 election present us with a new Congress. We must press the Democrats in Congress and Biden to do what is possible. To not only deal with the international side of wiping out 
the COVID pandemic, but also curtailing the climate catastrophe we are facing. And I think this has to become the focus of a proactive foreign policy. Thank you for your attention.